Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Dominic. I work at Talk. I'm also the committee of Apache Aries. And today I'd like to talk with you about object-oriented programming. And especially I want to focus on the principles of this paradigm because I think we very, very often forget about those basic rules in this paradigm. Okay, uh, let's start with the quick definition. Mm, what is object-oriented programming? If you look at the Java tutorial at the Oracle website, uh, you will find the history about a lot of real-world objects in our daily life. We have dog, desk, whatever, and uh, we can, when we look at those objects, we can find out that they share two characteristics. One is that they have a state and also they have a behavior. And based on that simple idea, we can craft our software objects. And in, in them, uh, we design classes, which will be the blueprints for our objects. And then we have state uh, hidden in our fields and also some behavior exposed by the methods from our objects. So we are trying to model our programs, our world, our mm, yeah, programs world that we, that we want to uh, implement as set of simple objects. I like to think about those objects as a small computers. And of course we have to communicate um, in some way between those objects. And we, for that, we are using uh, the methods. I like to also think about those method calls as passing a message between, between, of, of, between those small computers. Um, and it's really helpful how to design our uh, software, our programs uh, as an object, as objects. Okay, simple. Probably, yeah, probably you heard about this, that uh, simple definition, but there are also some principles and they are really helpful how we can design and organize classes inside our project. Additionally, they work very well on several uh, levels of our design, not only on the classes level, but also some or even most of these rules are really helpful when we are trying to design modules, microservices or systems even. So let's look at those principles. First, we have four main basic principles of object-oriented programming, encapsulation, abstraction, inheritance, and polymorphism. We also have a solid principles. Solid, solid is the um, acronym created from the first letters of, these, uh, of the principles in that set. We also have a GRASP. And GRASP is more the umbrella name for several other principles gathered in that set. For our presentation, the um, basic principles of object and the programming will be our guides. So let's start with the first one, encapsulation. Encapsulation is a fancy word that we can translate for us as a information hiding and also grouping our data together. So if you want to um, follow this principle, we should build a capsule inside our uh, object. Our object should be, should be a kind of capsule. When we do so, we are reducing the complexity of the of our system because it's hidden inside that uh, inside that object. And additionally, because they are, um, you can only manage them in via some interface, for example, and you shouldn't touch everything in inside that uh, um, inside that object without control. We gain security. Let's start with the first example: how we can create such well encapsulated an object that encapsulates state in a proper way. When you define a class task, for example, with one field name, then after reading the first tutorial, probably you know that this is wrong because you should hide your field in your object. So for that in Java, we can use the private keyword. Um, and yeah, now the field is hidden, but the next step in several tutorials I saw uh, looks like let's now add the setter and getter for that uh, property because we, we want to and we need to change something inside that object. For more modern version of Java, probably you can even use a libraries like Lombok where you, by adding a simple annotation, could get, generate just sim, such boilerplate code for one field or even for all the fields inside our objects. And every time I see code like that, I know that this is the same as putting the public keyword in front of our field and it's not the real way how we encapsulate object. Mm, this is the technical debt that we are paying for Java beans in our, mm, in, our, in our industry. 
I don't want to say that creating such Java means that you can see a structure is something bad. For data transfer objects, it's probably fine solution. But when you want to create real object and hide the state of this, uh, of this object, this is not the best approach. What's the problem with, with such setters, getters, and, and Java Beans approach? When you have a setter, then using a setter is not something, um, naming something as a, as a setter is not uh, the word that you can spot in discussion with some experts, with some uh, analytics, and so on. And it's always better to use more proper name that describe the situation, how you want to interact with that in that uh, with that object maybe only somewhere inside you set the state to a proper variable but probably you can that you can do that inside your object by simple assignment you don't need setters for that on the other hand you have getters and you can have a simple getter sometimes it, they are really useful even in real world object so for example you get uh, you can get name of uh, of the task and here, instead of having string, for example, we can return some wrapper. And probably this is the immutable value and nothing, nothing special could happen with that, uh, with that variable. No one can change that. There is even an, a convention where you can omit the get keyword and uh, not the keyword, the get part of the, of the name of the method and, uh, and have methods like that. But this is the matter of the of convention. The bigger problem is when we have for example, some container that uh, as, as list in Java. And when we try to return the attachment, attachments from our, um, from our task class, then for example, we can spot that someone could change something on, the, on that list. Maybe remove, remove something from that, add something new, maybe change the order. And that's why we should always for our getters generate some immutable collection, immutable wrapper on, 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 on our collection that we keep internally. And even if we do so, the problem is that the items on in that list could be mutable. So we should even return the copy of that, of that object or some view from that object, not return the collection that we have inside. And with the getter setter annotation also with the uh, getters and setter um, generated by the IDE, we don't have such, uh, such features. Another problem with getter is when we try, when we are trying to return something that can be null. So for example, here from the task, we can get assignee ID and probably it would be much, much better to return the optional value and for example, in the getter, we can wrap the value in our state, but there is also another approach that we can create optional field in our object and keep our object uh, state, the field inside as, uh, as the optional. And of course, there will be a lot of discussion that you shouldn't do so because optional is not designed for that feature. But when your object is well encapsulated, then this is the internal matter, how you design your, your state, how you organize it. So I don't care if, if it's helpful, if it, uh, the optionality inside my, my object is uh, helpful for the design for the whole object and the order operation that I have inside, then why don't have such, such field in my, in, my, in my object? Okay. Um, also with the such Java beans, we have a problem when we try to rename a field. When you start some, um, click the refactor button and try to re rename a field of such uh, object in your, uh, in your project, then probably you will be asked about renaming also the getters and setters of these um, derived from this uh, field name, or maybe you can also rename some variable of method parameters derived from the getters and setters. And sometimes when you especially work with Java beans, you can get a lot of changes in several places in your system, but when I see such code, it means that we, we didn't encapsulate the state in a proper way. On the other hand, when the state is really well encapsulated, you will have a really small set of changes. Maybe you have changed only one object, only one class that uh, contains that field, maybe additionally some tests, but that's all. And when we design such class, when we, when we drop the approach with Java beans, we can create 
nice classes with nice interfaces where we, for example, have one getter where, because we need that. We have some purpose to, to have such getter for it's necessary for another object. We have methods uh, more connected with our domain, like assign to, resolve, reopen, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, uh, I also want to mention the visibility uh, of the things that we have inside our object. Probably you know that all the fields should be private. Some of them, when we want to support inheritance, can be protected. I prefer to avoid that, uh, that keyword. I prefer to keep everything private if it's possible. Additionally, when you design a methods, most of the methods inside your object should be probably private especially when we create a lot of small methods because we uh, want to implement the approach known from the clean code of Uncle Bob. Only some of those methods should be package private, maybe protected, maybe public, but this set of the exposed method should be as small as possible. And when I see the annotation, for example, visible for testing, that means that that method, that thing should be private, but for the test purpose, we want to make it um, make, make bigger visibility level of, these, uh, of the method, that this is the sign that maybe we encapsulated the state inside, but we miss the next um, big principle of object-oriented programming, which is abstraction. Abstraction is, for me, uh, the, the best explanation what is abstraction is a creating object with good and useful API. Because in our world, implementation changes very, very often. How we keep everything inside, how the algorithms that we are using look like, that's something that changes. But some abstractions, some interfaces, how, some descriptions that are useful for another objects is something that should stay with us for a much, much longer time. And when we are able to gain such bigger abstraction, create better abstraction, we are hiding all the unnecessary information from our object. And we, of course, expose only the essential information and information for another object. Thanks to, do, thanks to that, we are improving the readability of our object. And of course, we are hiding the complexity inside that um, object. And now when we want to create uh, really good abstraction, it's very good to treat our object as information experts. Information expert is, could, be, um, could be translated as delegating responsibility to the object that has most or all the knowledge necessary to perform such ta some task. For example, let's imagine that we have a Java bean again task, and from that task we get a status, we get the assignee, and based on those two fields we make some condition, probably in the body of that condition we perform such some action. But the problem here is that all the information that we extracted from the task, this is on the only information that we need to perform the operation. So why don't just ask our task if that task can be reopened, and if so, we can reopen the task with some specific uh, reason and maybe some, in some way it will be stored inside our task. And this code looks fine, but probably inside the reopen method, we, we will have to also call the, some, some internal uh, method can be reopened. So there is also a rule called tell don't ask. And this rule stands that our task when we create that, don't ask what is the internal state. Can I perform the operation? Just let's let's do the let's the, perform the operation. Let's reopen the task, and the task class will tell us by exception or by returning false that something bad happened. If not, maybe void. Maybe no news is good news. Maybe we'll have a new version of task and so on and so forth. But it will be hidden inside such operation. But when we want to do um, apply that approach in our software that probably we should keep our object always in valid state. And it means also that we should have as quick validation as it possible. So for example, instead of after perform, after creating the task and performing some operation that having a method, is that task okay? The better approach will be to, in the constructor, in all the methods, 
validate the input parameters and also our state. And if something is not possible, shouldn't be possible in our um, object, then just throw exception or return false or whatever to tell the user of that API that uh, the operation was wrong. Don't wait for, a, for explicit validation. And when we create such uh, information experts, then we should also respect that another object are also information experts. So for that, we have the law of the matter, which can be described as, as the good role that we should not talk to the strangers. Let's imagine that our task class, uh, class um, has locked work property, locked work, uh, um, locked, uh, work uh, field, and this is the friend, the, our friend, yeah? But when we, for example, throw from such log to work, get works item, which could be a list, could be another object, and we are trying to add something to, to that thing, this is the stranger for us. We, we are talking with the stranger. So instead, we should respect that log to work is, a, is an information expert. It, it is its duty to in some way lock work internally. So it's much more better to call that method, uh, one method of that uh, object uh, because he is the information expert now. And yeah, when we think about the such responsibilities, we also have a rule called single responsibility principle. Um, this rule stands for, um, stands for that our class or method should have only one reason to change. So our class should manage one thing, have one responsibility, and should do it well. When we want to achieve that in our software, we should fight for as high cohesion as possible. So cohesion is a way of measuring how much uh, element inside our module class method, how much they are be they belong together, and how much they have to be used in common in our software. And we can take advantage of some ID or static analyzer hints to, uh, to find out that uh, how big is the cohesion in our project. Um, and here I want to mention one metric called lack of cohesion of methods. This metric is uh, abbreviated to LCOM4 because this is the fourth version of this metric. And it tells us how many clusters of methods and fields we have inside our object. It's if, if the LCOM4 is equal to zero, this is the information that we don't have any, um, any methods uh, in, the, in, in our object. So probably this is more a data structure. If the LCOM4 is equal to one, this means that our all the fields and all the methods are in some way combined together and has to be um, together to be uh, to be used, and this is the perfect situation that we want to achieve in our classes. If the LCOM4 is bigger than one, then probably this is the information that our class, for some reason, should be uh, separated into several other classes. And what worth mentioning is uh, here that constructor to string equals hash code. Um, setters, getters are very often excluded from that um, from that matrix because we are more focusing on methods that express the real behavior, uh, not just the methods that we are normally implementing in our in our object just to have some boilerplate. Um, that's we think about the internals of our object. But on the other hand, uh, when we are thinking about the connections between the object that we have, we should fight for the low coupling. Coupling is a way of measuring how much, uh, how, how big is the relation between one element and another one. Maybe one element use, uses another element, maybe it knows about it, uh, maybe it rely on it for, in some way, for example, on the internal state, maybe um, it rely on the order of, uh, the order of execution of the methods of, that, uh, of another object uh, has to be specific and so on and so forth. So we want to have such coupling as small as possible. We, when we do so, we are minimizing dependencies between classes in our project. And also all the changes that we, maybe not all, most of the changes that we apply for, uh, for our objects um, become more local. And also the components, such classes that we are designing in such way can be easier to reuse in several places because you, for example, don't have to take them with several other classes that always have to be uh, used in some combination. 
Here, there is a very, very old technique called CRC cards. CRC stands for Class Responsibility Collaborator. Um, and this is a small piece of paper where you write a name for a class and, and make a list of responsibilities of that, uh, of that class and also a list of collaborators. And only looking at that list, you can spot that, for example, your class can break uh, single responsibility principle or of or low coupling uh, principle. And this is the, the, the information for you that maybe you should split your class into several other classes. But how to split such classes? For that, we have the dependency inversion principle from SOLID. This rule is about components, high-level components, uh, which should be independent from all the low-level components. So. Um, in easier words, our objects should depend on abstraction, not on concrete objects in the, uh, in the system. Let's imagine that we have some task service, which is the middle of the domain of our, um, of our code. And for us, this task service will be the controller. And controller from Grasp could be, um, we, can, we can look at it uh, as a dispatcher of some of some logic inside our code base. Uh, what is crucial, this is, this is not the same as controller from MVC. In MVC, we are more working on the HTTP level. On, in controller, this is more the logic, the domain uh, dispatching uh, request. And it's more connected with domain, not just the infrastructure. And when we have such task controller, this is something concrete. So we need to create some abstraction, some, uh, some level of indirection. So for example, here we create the use case interface that would be used just for adding task. And such indirection, uh, which we can create by using the, some interfaces, but also by creating uh, adapters, implementing adapter, bridge, facade, mediator, and several others, uh, other um, design patterns from Gang of Four uh, book, we can gaze, gain such uh, indirection to make our objects separated from each other. Um, so when our task service um, to perform its operation, probably we'll, we'll have to ask uh, some, not ask, but talk with the rabbit event sender because we want to send some event for to, to, to some message queue. Maybe we also want to save something in the database so we have a specific repository. And for that specific classes, we don't have to, uh, we don't want to have a connection between our task service. We want to depend on some abstract things. So for that, we are creating interface event sender and also task repository. On the other side of our application, uh, our task controller won't be uh, won't depend on task service. It will depend on our interface describing the use case available in our domain. Um, task controller, which is the normal um, control MVC controller, uh, is only one way how we can create task. We can also create task, for example, from some events from from some message queue. And when we design our software in such way, we can now create a, a rectangle, rectangle that describes the, 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 the core domain, for example, for, for our problem that we want to um, solve today. And when you look at that implementation, where you put the interfaces and how you are um, independent from low level um, features of your of your software, uh, you can spot that this is the implementation of hexagonal architecture, known also as sports and adapters or clean architecture, on your architecture. Um, basic idea of this architecture is to put our domain code also with some application services uh, inside our um, inside some area, which is um, which is which has a boundary created from the ports, and such ports in our situation uh, in in our project uh, will be the interfaces. And also, we have some adapters, some helpful things which translates the external world uh, requests to our domain, and also translates the domain um, request to the external world. Okay, there are also another object rows that we have in um, in Grasp. We have a creator. If you look at this uh, pattern, it's pretty simple. You can think about that, that this is factory, but 
it doesn't have to be a normal factory when you have, for example, a switch statement and, for example, based on some input parameters, you are creating a different version of classes. You can have even a small factories, small creators. For example, our task could be the creator of attachments from link, maybe some moment of time when the link was added, and also by adding um, some information that are inside the task and task uh, has them as information expert, you are creating, creating new attachment um, objects. You also have pure fabrication pattern. Uh, you can think about pure fabrication as creating domain services from DDD, but the bigger picture is that we want to create some object that um, allow us to not break another rules. For example, to, to achieve low coupling in the software, but also to um, have single responsibility. So, and we very, very often name such thing um, in a way which we don't have a direct translation to the domain that we are operating with. So for example, here we create a task estimation calculator, which is the wrapper just for a utility method, could be seen as utility method, for calculating final estimation uh, from several tasks that, uh, that we pass to that calculator. Okay, when we, um, when, when we work with such abstraction, when we work on such abstraction to achieve better abstraction, uh, we want to avoid leaky abstraction in our software. Uh, let's, um, let's imagine that we have some stream of operations uh, I'm sorry, some, some stream of, uh, of data. And at the end of such stream, we very, very often want to create some materialized collection. So for example, we have a collect method with passing a specific collector and we receive a list. And to that list, we can of course add something. But when you, from it started from Java 9 as far as, far as I remember, you can use the to list method instead of collector. And you also receive a list, but when you try to add something to that list, you will see that uh, this list is immutable. The problem here is that list in Java 17, also in 18, has more than 20 methods. Some of those methods like contain, size, stream, and so on, are pretty useful for all kinds of list, lists. But when you have a methods like add, remove, set, clear, those methods names imply that your object is mutable. And this is, this, this is the example of violating interface segregation principle from SOLID. This principle uh, tells us that we should create small and concrete interfaces in our software, and it's better to have several interfaces with one, two, maybe three methods that express the, 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 the specific um, abstract some things in a, in, a, in a good way than having one big interface with, I don't know, 20 or 30 methods, which describe two big things and probably there will be always someone who violate uh, at least one of the rules that we have assigned to that um, methods. Okay, the next principle of object-oriented programming is inheritance. Inheritance is a, um, you can think about that as creating new objects, new classes, uh, based on another classes. So for example, we can have a task class um, and for most of the, of the situation, it is, it is fine to create just a task class, but for some specific um, things in our project, we want to create something, uh, a task with some tweaked uh, method uh, that, that better describe the, the, the task. So we created programming class, research task, and so on and so forth. Sometimes it's also useful to create such task class as uh, something abstract that you can create instances of that classes and you can only use the specific version of the uh, specific implementations uh, of that uh, tasks. Here, no matter which you choose, you should follow this of substitution principle. Uh, this rule for me is about not surprising anyone and also respecting the contract that we described in our abstract class. Because all the specific classes that we create in our software should be always able to be used where the base class is declared. So for example, our task class 
Here it's abstract and it's um, created a contract that you have estimate method here that returns the estimation. And for example, the calculator that you saw previously could take advantage of this uh, method and calculate the final estimation by calling the uh, specific estimation of, uh, of each task and at, at the end summing the, um, the estimations. But for example, we can imagine that some specific task, for example, here external task, you cannot have estimation, so it will throw the exception. And this is the sign when um, that we cannot use such external task in our in every context that our task class can be used. This is also the um, there's also some other rule which is a little bit connected with that. It's open close principle. Uh, I am talking about that in the in the chapter about inheritance, but it's also connected with designing another things, and 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 it's not only strict to the uh, to the inheritance. Um, this rule stands for creating classes, methods, or module uh, which are open for extension, but on the other hand, that should be closed for modification. Um, really strange rule, yeah. But for us, it means that we should keep protected variations in our software. It means that the um, for our base classes, especially our base classes in terms of inheritance, we do we should identify possible changes and instabilities. And around them, we should create some specific interface. So for example, when we have a class task and we know that the estimation is sometimes cannot be calculated, then we should create the method that returns the optional instead of returning the estimation, just to create a better API. But sometimes when we use, uh, when we want to take advantage of inheritance, we can also create a leaky abstraction. Leaky abstraction in terms of inheritance is when we, for example, have to have explicit branch, for example, to as, as you can see here, to check if the task is type of in external task. And for that, we, for example, have to catch the exception that was thrown from that uh, estimate method. And for all the other tasks, we have a normal, uh, normal stuff. And probably it has to be implemented in our uh, calculator. So we have to change a lot of another places. So our code is not very extensible and the inheritance doesn't work as, uh, as it was designed. Uh, here, I also want to mention uh, the sealed classes, which are very nice feature in Java and probably in several other uh, programming languages. In most of them, we have some kind of, of, of seed classes now. And uh, seed classes is a class that always know about all the specific implementation of that class. So we created a status class here and it has only two implementation, success and failure. And we can take advantage of that, for example, by using switch expressions that uh, are not preview feature probably now in Java 18. And the problem with that code, uh, code is that when it it's local to status class, probably it's fine, but when it's used in several places away from the from our status class, then we have such leak abstraction. So when we try to add something, add some new state to such status, we will have to change all the switch expressions in several places in the system. So our abstraction is really, really leaky in such situation. And okay, there is also another um, leaky abstraction uh, which I call the unnecessary abstraction. In Java, you have the object class and object class is the root of, of the hierarchy of classes. And you have a methods here like equals, hash code and to string. But when you want to use those methods, probably in your more specific class, you have to override this method, implement them on your own. So the implementation, the default implementation is just, it's, it's just, Something, something that you can just throw away and always, um, and you always have to remember about uh, rewriting them as you as you will uh, need them probably in, in in another form. So for that, I would prefer to have have some specific interfaces like supports equality or supports printing to describe that only when my object supports the feature uh, of, of equality, then I will add the interface, not that I have it uh, received from the, uh, from the base class. 
Okay, so when there is a lot of such rules um, and a lot of such uh, possible mistakes that we can uh, we can make, maybe it's okay sometimes to prevent inheritance. And remember that allowance for inheritance is your design decision. And even if you if you decide that you want to support that, then you can still decide what and how can be specialized in your classes. For example, you can put a final keyword in front of the class, and of course you cannot extend such class in your software. Sometimes you want to be able to extend such class, but maybe some of those methods, um, some of methods of that class can be final because you don't expect anyone to override that uh, method in the more specific classes. Um, this is Java approach, but Kotlin has quite nicer uh, approach where all the things, all the classes, all the methods are final. And if you want to make them available for extension, you can put the open keyword in front of the class or the method. And there is also a question why we want to uh, use inheritance so much in our software. And it's because there is a rule called don't repeat yourself. And this is the easier way how we can not, uh, not repeat uh, ourselves. We can sometimes think about that, that we should not repeat field groups or we should not repeat behaviors. And this is the reason for us for creating inheritance. But there is something bigger. We should not repeat business concepts that we are creating in, the, in our software. And also it means that for the knowledge, for such business thing, we should always create a single representation in the system. But do we need for that the inheritance? I think that there is a quote that I very often hear from children that this is the same, but different. And you should always put on some scale how much the base class and the specific classes that you want to create, how much they are the same and how much they, they, they are different. And remember that the inheritance is very specific and um, form of coupling that make very tight connection between your um, base class and especially your more specific classes. So maybe this is there is a better approach for that. And of course we have a composition. Composition is a you can describe it as uh, taking another object and based on those another object you can express your behavior that you need for your uh, for your software. So you can combine them in some way, but also you can decorate and delegate some uh, some operation to another object. So for example, you can create the interface estimable. Maybe it's not a good uh, good name, but I wasn't able to find the, the proper one. Maybe your business expert will be helpful for uh, for that. And here we have the method uh, declared method estimate. And our class uh, task can be implement that interface and it even can be final. And we can create some another class. Here we created external duty that just implements the estimable interface we share the same behavior, we express the same behavior, but here we have a task class internally, maybe we can uh, have only another interface uh, and we'll probably use that, uh, use that field to calculate the estimation returned by, the, uh, by this class, but we don't have strict relation uh, as it is in inheritance. So for me, good interface is something uh, it's some, um, sometimes good enough in our software. It's much, much easier to use uh, than, than you can do with the inheritance. And that's why there is a, in my opinion, very good advice that you should prefer composition over inheritance because with composition, you are much, much more flexible in your software. Okay, the last big principle of object-oriented programming is polymorphism. Polymorphism is also, uh, is also a principle from GRASP. And from Greek, it's, uh, it means many forms. So what can have many forms? Um, it's about method names that could bring you different functionalities or behaviors in your software. So when they have the same name, how you can distinguish which one you want to, uh, you want to call, which one will be called by the, by, by the runtime. And it's because you have good type system and such types can be used instead of having explicit branches and writing them um, as if statement and so on. 
And there are two manifestations of uh, polymorphism. One is overriding. Overriding is when we, in our class task, we created the estimate method. Here it's not abstract, it's, uh, it's implemented. And in our external task, we make the estimate method our own uh, implementation of the estimate method. And when we want to call such estimate method on the task class, we don't know if it's it will be called on the external task, maybe it will be called on programming task on another um, task. The runtime will know and will call the proper method. Okay, next manifestation of polymorphism is overloading. Overloading is when for one method name or for the constructors, um, you have different parameter list in terms of the types that we have uh, on that list. So for example, we can create a task from some other task. We can create the task only with name, maybe with name and labels and so on and so forth. Uh, it's really helpful because it allows us to simplify the API using the same domain names that we normally use for performing such operations. Um, but also it allows us to add some default values um, when we want to have them explicitly added in our software. And for me, it's also really helpful uh, to, to use overloading because it helps to evolve our API in very nice uh, way. For example, we can have a parameter as finish uh, method in our class. Um, and here we, from a some static factory, we get the specific moment of time when the finish, uh, when the task was finished. Probably in legacy code, it works fine. But now when we want to, for example, test it, or uh, create, um, finish the task based on some events where we have the time hidden there, then such methods cannot be used in an in a easy way. So we can create a new one where we, we just explicitly pass this parameter, but still keep the older version where uh, the, the, the specific moment of time was taken from the factory. Probably now we can, we can live with those two methods, but in several actions, when you want to evolve your API, you can make the first method duplicated and mark it as for removal. And your ID probably help you, um, can help you how you can find those finished methods and replace them in an easy way to, to use the new method uh, with the one parameter. And of course, probably of, we, we, we don't have to call the uh, instant um, now method, but we can take the, now, the, the instant from the, uh, from the clock and so forth. And so, uh, and, and it will be much help, easier for, uh, for reusing in our uh, software. But remember that overloading is not a silver bullet. If you know the better name for some domain operation, it's a good time also for renaming such feature. You don't have to have the same. Uh, names. Okay, that was the four princi basic principles of object-oriented programming with several other principles. Now I want to leave you with some key takeaways. Um, first, hide all the details, hide uh, all the unnecessary information inside your object, make the real capsule. Um, next, expose only the necessary information from your, from your object, only the information that other object needs to use uh, to perform its own operations. Um, know the rules, know the principles, but on the other hand, uh, know when and why you can break those rules. They are not enforced by the compiler or, of course, that you can add you some plugins for the compiler or the plugin for your IDE, for, for your CI scripts uh, and so on to break the build when, when you don't follow all the, all the rules. But sometimes it's better to make a decision that you want to not obey some, some principles than blindly following all the principles. And the last thing, don't write your code, don't write your classes, always design them, think how and what pri principles they are using in the software and yeah, make the real decision, not just go with the flow. Okay, thank you very much. That's all from me. And I will be glad to hear some questions so we can come back to the studio.